The great challenge of your life will be how to live out your personal story, pursue your personal dreams, enjoy your personal compassions and compulsions and interests in a world that is getting better, not worse, where the forces of positive interdependence outweigh the negative ones. In that pursuit, I have only two pieces of personal advice. One is you should strive to find happiness every day and not believe it comes at the end of a journey. And most people are happiest doing what they're good at. You have been given the power through your education to pursue what you're good at. The second piece of advice, there is something to be said for not quitting, not giving up, and showing up through the difficult times as well as the easy ones. If you pursue your dreams, you can't quit when you fail, you can't quit when you mess up, and you can't quit when life seems to deal you a tough hand. You have been given the tools to triumph. Now it is up to your will, your mind, and your heart. Now, here's what I want to say about the interdependent world. You have to decide what you'd like the world to look like when your children are sitting where you're sitting today. I know what I want it to look like. I want it to be a world of shared opportunities and shared responsibilities, a world with a sense of deep community across all our differences and a profound obligation to the future, a world where we use the earth that we've been given, but where we do whatever it takes to preserve it for our grandchildren, a world where we celebrate our differences, but we believe our common humanity matters more. Now. If that's the world you want, you have to ask yourself, how do you get it? You must build up the positive and reduce the negative forces raging across our interdependent world and piercing all our net-like borders. What are the most important negative forces of interdependence? The world we live in is too unequal as you celebrate today your graduation from one of the great universities in this or any nation, there are two things you need to remember. First, college graduates this year will have more personal debt than any class before you. And second, in the last decade, the United States which still ranks first in the world in the percentage of our young people going on to university, dropped from first to twelfth in the percentage of our young people actually achieving four-year college degrees in no small measure because of a shrinking economy and rising cost. We have to do something about that, but that is a manifestation of growing inequality across the world within and among countries. Second. The world you live in is unstable, not just because violence can cross borders and non-state actors can cause trouble, but because disease can cross borders, because the financial crisis, which sadly began here, spread almost instantaneously, first to the United Kingdom, then Ireland, then Iceland, then to the exporting countries because people couldn't afford to buy their products. We have to find a way to reduce the negative instability of modern life without going to a totally static world where nothing would grow. And finally, the world we live in is unsustainable because of the way we produce and consume energy. We have to find a way to put more people to work by reducing our carbon and other greenhouse gas emissions instead of increasing them. Now, 
final question. So how do you do that? The only thing I want to say about that today is there is a fundamental difference between the challenge facing the poorest places and the challenges facing the wealthiest. In Haiti, where I spend much of my life now, we just inaugurated a new president. In Africa, in Southeast Asia, and Latin America, where we sell the world's least expensive AIDS and malaria medicines and help to build up health systems, what they need are systems, things you take for granted. They need systems. And a lot of you have worked in places where you see young people just as intelligent as you are, just as hardworking as you are. They simply don't have life chances because they don't have the systems that guarantee good consequences for hard work and good behavior. That is a big challenge. The problem with all countries that have great systems is they get long in the tooth. That they become so successful that those who run them are more interested in holding on to their positions and advancing the purposes for which they were established. More interested in maintaining the gains of the present than achieving even greater ones for our children in the future. For example, I believe America has been hurt badly in the last 30 years by adopting two bad ideas that serve the interest of people who are sitting atop the various totem poles in America today. I was probably the last generation of Americans until the present day who could have gotten an MBA if I'd gone to business school instead of law school, with the prevailing theory being that American corporations had obligations primarily to all their stakeholders. Ever since then, we've been teaching our young people that your primary obligation is only to the shareholders. The problem is, if you do that, you ignore the other stakeholders. That could be why wages have been virtually stagnant for 30 years, because the workers are stakeholders. It could be why communities haven't been able to undertake economic transformations in many places, because communities are stakeholders. It could be why customers don't care so much what the source of their purchases are. They're stakeholders. I think we have to move back toward a stakeholder, not just a shareholder-only society in the United States and throughout the world. The second wrong idea is that the only problem America has is that the government, especially the national government, messes everything up that it touches. It would mess up a two-car parade. There is no such thing as a good tax, no such thing as a bad tax cut, no such thing as a good regulation, no such thing as a bad deregulation. That contradicts the evidence in the United States and every other country in the world. The only truly successful countries have both strong economies and effective governments and a public-private partnership to share the future. That is the ultimate answer to this debate going on today. For example, 2012 will mark the year that the Kyoto Accord on Climate Change expires. In 1997, when the Kyoto Accord was completed, there were 44 wealthy countries that promised to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by a specific amount. Only four will certainly make it. Denmark, Sweden, Germany, and the United Kingdom. Before the financial meltdown, all four had lower unemployment rates in America, and all four had reached their goal in radically different ways, but they did have one thing in common. There was a public-private partnership, a commitment to grow the economy, start businesses, reduce inequality, and prove it was good economics to save the planet for our grandchildren. It is a cautionary tale for the future. So do what you love and work hard at it and don't quit. Create a world of shared opportunities, shared responsibilities, and a shared sense of community. Believe in this small planet 
that the only way to win the future is to share it. The only way to share it is to do it in a way that preserves it for our children and grandchildren and believe that our differences really matter. Think of the remarkably different careers the people who have received honorary degrees have had today. But we all got here because at some level, at critical junctures, what prevailed was an understanding that our common humanity matters more. The Human Genome Project has revealed that we are somewhere between 99.5 and 99.9 percent .9 the same, that every non-age-related difference you can see in this audience, including gender and race, is rooted in somewhere between a tenth and a half a percent of our genetic differences. And yet, almost all of us spend 99.5 percent of our time thinking about the half a percent of us that is different, even obsessing about it and wishing it were more so. So that is what I leave you with. I wish you well. I think it can be the most interesting time in human history, an age of prosperity and peace and discovery, but only if it is an age of genuine community and sharing. Good luck, and God bless you. John 14, 6 of the Bible says, No one comes to the Father except through me. But saying, No one comes to the Father except through me, is not the same thing as saying that only Christians can get into heaven. No one comes to the Father except through me, says only that Jesus decides who does, and who does not, get into heaven. I am sure that if Jesus had wanted to say that only Christians can get into heaven, he would have said that only Christians can get into heaven. But he did not say that. He said only that he will decide who gets into heaven. I will take my chances for now, and simply love my neighbors in the way that Christ commanded be done by all who believe in him. In the Satchasada, or the true business. And this is really at the heart and soul of Sikhism, that a man cannot think about his relationship with God if he is hungry. And it is our true business to see that our fellow man is taken care of.